This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people who will hold the truth in Jesus Christ's name. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today they offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. So, welcome everybody to a new video from Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. And this is going to be the third part, the third reading of the new book, History of the Inquisition. That was written in 1692, very, very long time ago. 1692, by Limborch, a Dutch man, a man from the Netherlands. And this book was translated in 1731 into English, and that's the version that I'm going to read to you. We are still busy in the introduction on page 9 in the book, as you can see on your screen, uh, page 34 in the PDF, which you know I provide to you the link uh, in the description box of this video. And we are starting with uh, a little bit that I have read before. So I'm, I'm not going to read the whole book in advance because I cannot read 750 pages once or twice. I don't have the time. I will read this <coughs> and discuss this with you right along. But in the beginning I have had a little bit more time and studied a few pages on beforehand like these ones. And here and there I took a little note, as you can see here, with Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, the one that we are going to continue. Because you remember we were reading here on the bottom of page 8 after these two, <laughs> for me, very hard to read um, poems um, that Plutarch, yeah, just to back up a paragraph for continuation's sake, that Plutarch also relates that in this time uh, some of the Egyptians who worship the dog eat the flesh of the fishes with others of the Egyptians adored as their deity. And that upon this the fish eaters laid hold on the other's dogs and sacrificed and ate them, and that this gave occasion to a bloody battle in which a great number were destroyed on both sides. So I commented already on that in the last time that we were reading this, and now we continue with 
Antiochus Epiphanes, who many of you maybe do not know, therefore I will provide a link in uh, gutquestions.org that I found on the internet there you can read a little bit about Antiochus Epiphanes. And the little bit that I know or think is uh, important to tell you about him before starting the reading is that Antiochus Epiphanes by many people is seen as uh, the Antichrist or one of the Antichrists when you are following the preterist realm of the Antichrist. You know, you have three possibilities how to identify the Antichrist. Two, of course, are wrong and one is right. So what are these three possibilities to identify the Antichrist of the Bible? The one is the Roman Catholic teaching of preterism that was brought into the world by Louis Alcazar in 1614, a Jesuit priest, of course. The other one is the futurist interpretation that was brought into the world widely because it was known within the Roman Catholic Church's teaching already for centuries, but it was brought outside to the public in 1590 by Jesuit priest um, Francisco Ribera. And then, of course, there's the one true biblical historical view of the Antichrist and that is the one where you take the Bible and take what is written in there by prophets like Daniel, by apostles like Paul and John and who they identify as the Antichrist. So you have three quote-unquote schools of how you can learn who the Antichrist is and in the preterist view of the Antichrist many people identify Antiochus Epiphanes who we are going to read about right here now as one of the Antichrist and I tell you right now that the preterist view as well as the futurist view are both Jesuitical deceptions they are both wrong there's only one right view, and that is the view that God gives us in his book, in the Bible itself. That is the historicist view. That is the view that the Protestants held. That is the view that the Apostles held. That is the view that everybody held who was a true Bible-believing Christian from the very apostolic beginning times of the forming of the Church of Jesus Christ. But... Okay, let's start with Antiochus Epiphanes. Though a very wicked prince, uh, prince because he was a Roman, uh, a Roman, yet was a zealot for his religion and endeavored to propagate it by all the methods of the most bloody persecution. Josephus tells us that after he had taken Jerusalem and plundered the temple, he caused an altar to be built in it, upon which he sacrificed swine, which were an abomination to the Jews and forbidden by their laws. Yeah, just have to make a little comment here because, you know, when Antiochus Epiphanes went into a temple in Jerusalem, so I guess that is still before 70 AD, yeah, before the destruction of the temple and of Jerusalem, that uh, Antiochus Epiphanes was there, and he sacrificed swine on the altar, uh, which is an abomination to the Jews. It should be an abomination to the Jews that there is made any sacrifice in that temple after God ripped the veil of the temple from, from top to bottom anyway when Jesus Christ gave up the ghost on the cross. That is the moment that every sacrifice in the temple for God became an abomination. So it doesn't even matter that Antiochus Epiphanes even sacrificed swine on the altar, which is an abomination to the Jews, because every sacrifice on that altar in that temple should be an abomination to them, because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice in the midst of the 70th week of Daniel. Not content with this, that, <laughs> reading on here, not content with this, he compelled them to forsake the worship of the true God and to worship such as he 
accounted deities, building altars and temples to them in all the towns and streets and offering swine upon them every day. He commanded them to forbear circumcision, uh, circumcising their children, grievously threatening such as should disobey his orders. He also appointed uh, overseers, uh, and we know the word of overseers stands for bishops. He appointed overseers, he appointed bishops to compel the Jews to come in and do as he had ordered them. Such, such as rejected it were continually persecuted and put to death with the most grievous tortures. He ordered them to be cruelly scorched and their bodies to be torn and uh, before they expired under the tortures to be crucified. The women and the children which they circumcised were, by his command, hanged, the children hanging from the necks of their crucified parents. Wherever he found any of the sacred books or of the law, he destroyed them, undoubtedly to prevent the propagation of heretical opinions and punished with death such as kept them. The same author tells us also, in his History of the Maccabees, which is a book of the Apocrypha and not part of the Bible, that Antiochus put forth an edict whereby he made it death for any to observe the Jewish religion and compelled them by tortures to abjure it. Now, we have to see here is a little bit of a controversy. First and for all, some people will say, uh, well, uh, in this history of the Maccabees, well, if there is a history of the Maccabees, which is a part of the Jewish tribes, why isn't that in the Bible? Well, because it is for the most part that you can read the book of Maccabees historically correct, but it is not inspired writing. And only the inspired writings, the inspired writings by the ghost of God, by the Holy Spirit, people who were in uh, imputed with the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. Only those inspired writings are part of the Bible. All others are not part of the Bible. It's simple as that. You can like it, you cannot like it, but God said only the inspired writings are part of my word. The book of Maccabees is most and for all, like some other apocrypha books, part of of a historical record, but not inspired writings. And the second part that I want to make a little comment on is uh, where it says here, whereby he made a death for any to observe the Jewish religion. We have to see here that in this moment the author, I think, um, identifies the Jewish religion with Christian religion. I am not so sure about what he's speaking about, but anyway, uh, the early Christians were only called Christians at Antioch at the time, and I don't know exact about the time that uh, Antiochus Epiphanes is speaking here about, but Christendom is the religion, quote-unquote, religion, that came out of Judaism. But Judaism was perverted Bible-believing uh, 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 religion because Judaism was influenced by the Talmud and by Babylon. So, for anyone to observe the Jewish religion, whether he speaks about the pure Jewish religion, the true following word of the, of the Torah, of the word of God, or he speaks of early Christianity, does not matter that much to me at this moment here because both of them were persecuted by not only Antiochus Epiphanes, but also others. So, when he says, whereby he made us death for any to observe the Jewish religion and compelled them by tortures to abjure it, you were not allowed to follow any quote-unquote heathen, as it is called here, pagan religion, meaning anything that was not pagan in itself. <laughs> anything that uh, did not have to do with sun worship, with the traditions of the pagan Romans. Any other religion to them was heresy. 
as the Roman Catholic Church still today calls everything else but Roman Catholicism heresy. And Roman Catholicism, as we know, is built on Babylonian traditions. But let's continue reading. The inhumane barbarities he exercised upon Eleazar and the Maccabees, because they would not renounce their religion and sacrifice to his Grecian gods, are not, in some circumstances, to be paralleled by any histories of persecution, extent, and will ever render the name and memory of that illustrious tyrant execrable and infamous. It was on the same religious account that he banished the philosophers from all parts of his kingdom to charge against them being the corruption of the youth, i.e. teaching them notions of the gods, different from the common orthodox opinions which were established by law, commanding Phineas such a, uh, as such youth as converted with them should be hanged. Yeah? So, that means that every teaching of other quote-unquote gods that come not out of the Grecian Empire, as we can read here a little bit far, farther, uh, farther back, yeah, the Grecian gods and the, um, um, the adoration of these gods was made law, as we can read, yeah? Here, from the common orthodox opinions which were established by law, well, that is the same thing that is coming up to us today again. That the state will determine by law which god you can or how you can worship your god. This is already the first sign here that you see a combination of church and state. We are talking about the fourth beast. We are talking about the pagan Roman Empire, the one that was ruling when Jesus walked the earth. And we are speaking a little bit after that time. That fourth beast was exceedingly strong and different from the other beasts that went before him. You know, you remember the other beast, the lion, uh, the golden lion, which represents Babylon, the silver, um, um, the silver, uh, what was it, a bear, um, that represents um, Medo-Persia, and then you had uh, the bronze um, leopard, which represent Greek or Greece, the Grecian Empire. And then we had the fourth and last empire predicted by Daniel, and that is the pagan uh, Roman, <laughs> the pagan Roman Empire, which then later became the Holy Roman Empire, the Papal Roman Empire that we are still living in. Those are the four empires that Daniel predicted, and Daniel said that this fourth beast was different than the others. Well, the difference is that. In, Rome, uh, in the Roman Empire, you had the combination of church and state. And when it says here by the author, the common orthodox opinions which were established by law means that the law, the state, told the people how and who to worship. A combination of church and state. Just to make sure that you understand this very well. The ten persecutions, as they are reckoned, of the Christians by the Roman emperors, purely for their religion, huh? purely for their religion, the people were at that time persecuted. You know, there are a lot of people who say, yeah, but Protestants also killed Roman Catholics. Yeah, but never, ever, ever, purely on religious reasons, on religious grounds, only because they were doing regicide and were trying to kill and overcome kings and governments. But the Romans, the Roman emperors, persecuted purely for religion. going to start the sentence again. 
The ten persecutions, as they are reckoned, of the Christians by the Roman emperors purely for their religion, are standing monuments of their religious zeal, or rather of their outrageous fury against all who would not comply with the established religion. Indeed, the very civil constitution of Rome was founded upon persecuting principles. Tertullian tells us that it was an ancient decree that no emperor should consecrate a new god unless he was approved by the senate. <laughs> so the senate approves gods, eh? And one of the standing laws of the republic was to this effect, as Cicero gives it, quote, that no one should have separately new gods, no nor worship privately foreign gods unless admitted by the commonwealth. Okay. Law, <coughs> by the commonwealth's law, he endeavors to vindicate by reason and the light of nature by adding that no persons to worship their own or new or foreign gods would be to introduce confusion and strange ceremonies in religion. So true a friend was this eminent Roman and greater master of reason to uniformity of worship, and so little did he see the equity and indeed necessity of an universal toleration in matters of religion. Upon this principle, after he had reasoned well against the, uh, the false notions of God that had obtained amongst his countrymen and the public superstitions of religion, he concluded with what was enough to destroy the force of all his arguments. Quote, Tis the part of a man, uh, of a wise man, to defend the custom of his ancestors by retaining their sacred rites and ceremonies. Now, I hope that you understand that well. I'm going to read it again. Tis the part of a wise man to, the, uh, to defend the customs of his ancestors by retaining and their sacred rites and ceremonies. This is saying nothing else but that tradition is above the word of God. Here in the pagan Roman Empire, and this is the same continuously in the quote-unquote holy Roman Empire, in the papal Roman Empire that came out of the pagan Empire later. It's still the same empire. It is part of a wise man to defend the customs of his ancestors by retaining their sacred rites and ceremonies. Thus narrow was the foundation of the Roman religion, thus narrow was the foundation of the Roman religion, and thus inconsistent the sentiments of the wisest heathens with all the principles of toleration and universal liberty. It was no wonder, therefore, that Christianity, which was so perfectly contrary to the whole system of pagan theology, should be looked upon with an evil eye, or that when the number of Christians increased, they should incur the displeasure of the civil magistrate and the censure of the penal laws that were in force against them. The first public persecution of them by the Romans was begun by the mother of mankind, was begun by that monster. Sorry, <laughs> what am I reading here? I'm sorry. The first public persecution of them, meaning Christians, by the Romans was begun by that monster of mankind, Nero, who, to clear himself from the charge of burning Rome, endeavored to fix the crime on the Christians. And having thus falsely and tyrannically made them guilty, he put to death he put them to death by various methods of exquisite cruelty. But though this was the presence for this barbarity towards them, yet it evidently appears from undoubted testimonies that they were before hated upon account of their religion, and were therefore fitter objects to fall, as, uh, to, uh, to fall a sacrifice to the ret uh, resentment and fury of the tyrant. For Tacitus, another historian, tells us that they were hated for their crimes. What was their crime? Holding on to the God of the Bible. 
And what these were, he afterwards sufficiently informs us by calling their religion, quote, an execrable superstition, unquote. In like manner, Suetonius, in his Life of Nero, speaking of the Christians, says, quote, they were a set of men who had embraced a new and accursed superstition, unquote. And therefore, Tacitus' father informs us that those who confessed themselves Christians, quote, were condemned not so much for the crime of burning the city as for their hated uh, as for their being hated by all mankind. Unquote. Why are the Christians hated by all mankind, you ask yourself? Well, the same reason for today, because Christians don't love the world, Christians love Jesus Christ, have nothing to do with the world, and that's why they are hated by all mankind already from the beginning. So that is evident from these accounts that it was through popular hatred of them for their religion that they were thus sacrificed to the malice and fury of Nero. Many of them he dressed up in the skins of wild beasts that they might be devoured by dogs. Others he crucified. Some he clothed in garments of pitch and burnt them, that by their flames he might supply the absence of the daylight. The persecution begun by Nero was revived and carried on by Domitian, who put some to death and banished others upon account of their religion. Eusebius mentions Flavia Domitilla, niece to Flavius Clemens, then consul, as banished for his reason to the island Pontia. Dion, the historian's account of this affair, is somewhat different. Quote, he tells us that Fabius Clemens, the consul Domitian's cousin who had married Flavia Domitilla, a, rear, uh, a near relation of Domitian, was put to death by him, and Domitilla banished, uh, banished to Pandataria, being both accused of atheism, and that on the same account many who had embraced the Jewish rites were likewise condemned, some of them who were put to death, and others that their estates confiscated. Unquote. I think this account can belong to no other but the Christians whom Dion seems to have confounded with the Jews. A mistake into which he and others might naturally fall because the first Christians were Jews and came from the land of Judea. So here we are going to make a little note on what I said earlier before when we were reading two pages before and I told you that when he was speaking about the Jews that you have to consider that Jews and Christians of course were mixed uh, in together and that you have to make a distinction between the Jews who held on to the false Babylonian Jew Judaism and of course the first Christians, but the first Christians were Jews, as the writer rightfully, the author rightfully says here. Because the first Christians were Jews and came from the land of Judea. So of course you mix them up, you know, you don't always know when, whether they are Christians or they are Jews, when that has nothing to do with any blood anymore, but only with your belief system. The crime with which these persons were charged was atheism. Yeah, atheism because they did not accept the Grecian gods of the Romans, the ones that were put by law to be worshipped. The crime commonly imputed to Christians because they refused to worship the Roman deities, as the author confirms what I'm saying here. And as there are no proofs that Domitian ever persecuted the Jews upon account of their religion, not any imitation of this uh, of this nature in Josephus, in Josephus, who finished the antiquities towards the latter end of Domitian's reign, I think the account of Eusebius, which it's, uh, which he declares, he took from writers who were far from being friends to Christianity, is preferable to that of Dion's, and that therefore these persecutions by Domitian were upon account of Christianity. However they did not last long, for as Eusebius tells us, he put a stop to them by an edict in their favor. Tertullian also affirms the same and adds that he recalled those whom he had banished, so that though 
this is reckoned by ecclesiastical writers as the second persecution, it doth not appear to have been general or very severe. <coughs> Domitian also expelled all the philosophers of Rome and Italy. <laughs> to expel all the philosophers, I think, is not such a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Under Trajan, we continue otherwise a most excellent prince, began the third persecution in the fourteenth year of his reign. In answer to a letter of Pliny, he ordered, quote, that the Christians should not be sought after, but that if they were accused and convicted of being Christians, they should be punished, such only accepted as should deny themselves to be Christians, and give an evident proof of it by worshipping his gods. These are the pagan gods, of course, yeah? the ones adorned by the Senate. These were to receive pardon upon this their repentance, how much forever they might have been suspected before. From this imperial rescript, uh, it is abundantly evident that this persecution of the Christians by Trajan was purely on the score of their religion, because he orders that whatever was accused and convicted of being a Christian should be punished with death, unless he renounced his profession and sacrificed to the quote-unquote gods, the Grecian gods the Roman guards. All that was required, says Tertullian, was merely to confess the name without any recognizance being taken of any crime. Pliny himself, in his letter to the emperor, acquires them uh, of everything of this nature and tells him, quote, now let's see, uh, quote, that all they acknowledged, next page, was that their whole crime of error consisted in this, that at stated times they were used to meet before daylight and to sing an hymn to Christ as God, and that they would bound themselves by an oath not to commit any wickedness, such as thefts, robberies, adulteries, and the like. And to be assured of the truth of this, he put two maids to the torture, and after examining them, found them guilty of nothing but a wicked and unreasonable superstition. This is the noblest vindication of the, public, uh, of the purity and innocency of the Christian assemblies, and abundantly justifies the account of Eusebius from uh, Hegesippus, Hegesippus quote, that the Church continued until these times as a virgin, pure and uncorrupted. That is the real first church, yes, and proves beyond all contradiction that the persecution raised against them was purely on a religious account and not for any immoralities and crimes against the laws that would be proved against the Christians through, uh, though their enemies slandered them with the vilest and hereby endeavored to render them hateful to the whole world. Why, says Tertullian, do the Christians suffer, but for being of their number? Hath any one proved incest or cruelty upon us during this long space of time? No, tis for our innocence, probity, justice, chastity, faith, veracity, and for the living God that we are burnt alive. Pliny was forced to acquit them from everything but an unreasonable superstition, i.e. their resolute adherence to the faith of Christ. And yet, though innocent in all other respects, when they were brought before his tribunal, he treated them in this unrighteous manner. He only asked them whether they were Christians. If they confessed it, he asked them the same question again and again, adding threatenings to his questions. If they persevered in their confession, he condemned them to death, because whatever their confession might be, he was very sure that their stubbornness and inflexibility obstinacy preserved, uh, deserved punishment, so that without being convicted of any crime but that of constancy in their religion, this equitable heathen 
this rational philosopher, this righteous judge, condemns, condemns them to a cruel death. And for this conduct, the emperor, his master, commands him. For an answer to Pliny's question, whether he should go on to punish the name itself, though chargeable with no crimes, or the crimes only which attended the name, Trajan, in his rescript, after commanding Pliny, orders that if they were accused and convicted of being Christians, they should be put to death, unless they renounced that name and sacrificed to his gods. Tertullian and Athanagoras, in their apologies, very justly envy with great warmth against this imperial rescript. And indeed, a more shameful piece of iniquity was never practiced in the darkest times of popery. I hope also my reader will observe that this was lay persecution and owed its right uh, and owed its rise to the religious zeal of one of the best of the Roman emperors, and not only to the contrivances of cruel and de uh, defining priests that it was justified and carried on by a very famous and learned philosopher whose reason taught him that what uh, that what he accounted superstition if incurable was to be punished with death and that it was managed with great fury and barbarity multitudes of persons in the sev uh, several provinces being destroyed merely on account of the Christ of the christian name by various and exquisite methods of cruelty. The rescript of Adrian, his successor to Minucius Fondanus, pro-council of Asia, seems to have somewhat abated the fury of this persecution, though not wholly to have put an end to it. Tertullian tells us that Arius Autonius, uh, afterwards emperor, uh, then pro-council of Asia, when the Christians came in a body before his tribunal, ordered some of them to be put to death, and said to others, You wretches, I will die ye if you sorry, you wretches, if you will die ye have precipices and halters. He also says that several other governors of provinces punished some few Christians, and dismissed the rest, so that the persecution was not so general nor severe as under Trajan. Under Antonius Pius, the Christians were very cruelly really, uh, treated in some of the provinces of Asia, where occasioned uh, Justin Martyr to write his first apology. It doth not, however, appear to have been done either by the order of content, uh, consent of this emperor, on the contrary, he wrote letters to the cities of Asia, in particular to those in Larissa, Thessalonica, Athens, and all the Greeks, that they should create no new troubles to them. It is probable that the uh, Afi Asiatic, uh, it's probable that the Asiatic cities persecuted them by virtue of some former imperial edicts, which don't appear ever to have been recalled, and perhaps with the convenience of Antonius Philosophus, the college of uh, the colleague and successor of Pius in the empire. Under him began, as this generally accounted, the fourth persecution upon which Justin Martyr wrote his apology. Melitin, <coughs> ah, yeah, uh, 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 upon which Justin Martyr wrote his second apology, Melitin his and Athenagoras his legislation of embassy of the uh, or embassy of the Christians. Melitin, as Eusebius relates it, complains of it as an almost unheard of thing that pious men were persecuted and greatly distressed by new decrees throughout Asia that most impudent informers who were greedy of other persons' substance took occasion from the imperial edicts to plunder others who were entirely innocent. Innocent. Just because they are following the God of the Bible. They were persecuted. 
After this, he humbly beseeches the emperor that he would not suffer the Christians to be any longer used in so cruel and unrighteous a manner. Justin Martyr, in the account he gives of the martyrdom of Ptolemus, assures us that the only question asked him was whether he was a Christian. And upon his confessing that he was, he was immediately ordered to the slaughter. Lucius was also put to death for making the same confession and asking uh, Urbicus, the prefect, why he condemned Potelmi, who was neither convicted of adultery, who was neither convicted of rape, murder, theft, robbery, nor of any other crime, but only for owning himself to be a Christian. From these accounts, it is abundantly evident that it was still the very name of a Christian that was made capital, and that these cruelties were committed by an emperor who was a great master of reason and philosophy, not as punishments upon, of, uh, upon offenders against the laws and public peace, but purely for the sake of religion and confidence and conscience committed to maintain and propagate idolatry which is contrary to all the principles of reasons of philosophy and upon persons of great integrity and virtue in heart and life for their adherence to the worship of one God which is the foundation of all true religion and one of the plainest and most important articles of it. The tortures with, uh, which the persecutors of the Christians applied and the cruelties they exercised on them enough, one would think, to have overcome the firmest human resolution and patience, could never extort them from a confession of that guilt their enemies would gladly have fixed on them. And yet innocent as they were in all respects, they were treated with the utmost indignity and destroyed by much inventions of cruelty as were abhorrent to all the principles of humanity and goodness. They were indeed accused of atheism, i.e. for not believing in and worshipping the, uh, the fictitious gods of the heathens. This was the cry of the multitude against Polycarp. This is the doctor of Asia, the father of the Christians, the subverter of our gods, who teaches that they must not perform the sacred rites, nor worship our deities. This was the reason of the tumultuous cry against him, Away with those atheists! But would not one have imagined that reason and philosophy, sh uh, philosophy should have informed the emperor that this kind of atheism was a real virtue and deserved to be encouraged and propagated amongst mankind? <laughs> that is a very interesting question, eh? But would not one have imagined that reason and philosophy, philosophy uh, should have informed the emperor that this kind of atheism, Christianity, was a real virtue and deserved to be encouraged and propagated amongst mankind? Well, try to tell the Pope that today. No, reason and philosophy here failed him and his blind attachment to his country gods caused him to shed much innocent blood and to become the destroyer of the saints of the living God. At last, indeed, the Emperor seems to have been sensible to the great injustice of this persecution, and by an edict ordered they should be no longer punished for being Christians. If no, I shall not trouble my reader with an account of this persecution as carried on by Severus, Decius, Gallus, Valerianus, Diocletian and others of the Roman emperors, but only observe in general that the most excessive and outrageous barbarities were made use of upon all who would not blaspheme Christ and offer incense to the imperial gods. Now follows a very interesting little paragraph that I marked with its two colors, 
so please listen closely. They were publicly whipped, drawn by the heels through the streets of the city, wrecked till every bone of their bodies was disjointed, and their teeth beat out, their noses, hands and ears cut off. Sharp pointed spears ran under their nails, were tortured with melted lead thrown down their naked bodies, and their eyes dug out, their limbs cut off, were condemned to the mines, ground between stones, stoned to death, burned alive, thrown headlong from high buildings, beheaded, smothered in burning lime kilns, ran through the body with sharp spears, destroyed with hunger, thirst and cold, thrown to the wild beasts, broiled on gridirons with, with slow fires, cast by heaps into the sea, crucified, scraped to death with, a sharp, sh with sharp shells, torn in pieces by the boughs of trees, and, in a word, destroyed by all the various methods that the most diabolical, subtly and, mal, uh, and malice could devise. This account of persecution and torture and killing methods may sound cruel, but I can assure you, we are still only reading about the Roman emperors, we are still only giving account of the persecutions of the very first Christians through the pagan Roman Empire, the ways of torture and killing of the saints of Jesus Christ through the Antichrist, the little horn that came when he who now let it was been taken out of the way, the Roman Caesars, the Antichrist appeared on the scene, his persecutions were much more severe. And I can assure you right now, your hair will stand up in your neck when we give account to those inquisitions. And that's what all this book is all about. Even though, when you read this here, your, sh your hair should already stand up on the neck. And you have to understand that this, what I've just read, this account of dealing with Christians comes from the pagan Roman Empire. And the papal Roman Empire of today is just the continuation of that same empire, because Daniel spoke of four empires, not five. This came out of the of the fourth empire it is the same empire the persecution today and throughout the last centuries is the same and comes from the same empire are you gonna tell me that jews rule the world are you gonna tell me that freemasons rule the world when you read things and accounts like this i don't think so think again who is the antichrist who is the persecuting power who persecutes God and, this, and the saints of Jesus Christ on this earth? The Jews? Get a grip. Get a grip. The author continues. It must indeed be confessed that under the latter emperors who persecuted the Christians, the simplicity and purity of the Christian religion were greatly corrupted, and that ambition, pride and luxury had to generally prevailed both amongst the pastors and people. An interesting sentence, right? It must indeed be confessed that under the latter emperors who persecuted the Christians, the simplicity and purity of the Christian religion were greatly corrupted. Cyprian, the author continues, who lived under the Decian persecution, writing concerning it to the presbyters and deacons, says, quote, It must be owned and confessed that this outrageous and heavy calamity, which hath almost devoured our flock and continues to devour it to this day, hath happened to us because of our sins, since we keep not 
the way of the Lord, nor observe his heavenly commands given to us for our salvation. The heavenly commands were given to us for our salvation. We keep the commandments not because we want to get saved, but because we are saved. These commandments were given to us for our salvation. Very important sentence. Though our Lord did the will of his Father, yet we do not the will of the Lord. Our principal study is to get money and... Uh, Ah, yeah. Our principal study is to get money and estates. We follow after pride. We are at leisure for nothing but emulation and quarreling, and have neglected the simplicity of the faith. We have renounced this world in words only, and not in deed. We have renounced this world in words only and not in deed. How much does that apply to today evangelical Christians? How much does that apply to those of the people who call themselves Christians today? We have renounced this world in words only and not in deed. Everyone studies to please himself and to displease others. Not to please the Holy Spirit or Jesus Christ. Eh? After Cyprian, Eusebius, the historian, gives an account of the degeneracy of Christians about the time of the Diocletian persecution. He tells us that through, much of, uh, that through too much liberty, they grew negligent and slothful, envying and reproaching one another, waging, as it were, civil wars between themselves, bishops quarreling with bishops, and the people divided into parties. That hypocrisy and deceit were, groven, uh, were grown into the highest pitch of wickedness, that they were beca uh, become so insensible as not so much as to think of appeasing the divine anger, but that, like atheists, they thought the world destitute and any providential government and care and thus added one crime to another that the bishops themselves had thrown off all care of religion were perpetually contending with one another and did nothing but quarrel with and threaten and envy and hate one another were full of ambition and tyrannically used their power. Now I hope that you understand it what I read you because you see it is not very well printed and hard to read here and there. But what I just read to you that we are confessing to have left the world only by words and not by deeds and that we are divided among each other and just attack each other like the bishops that here, that here. Isn't this a fine description of what has become of America since they have been given all freedom? Uh, this is now the second author I read that makes that exact same statement on too much liberty leads into apostasy. When you give the people all the freedom they want, the first thing they do is they lose God out of their sight. They lose their face. God is no more important when you have all liberty. Now you understand maybe why Alistair Crowley was teaching, do as thou will shall be the whole of the law. When you have all liberty, then you don't need God, right? And this is the same thing that happened even to the early Christians, as this account that we've read here. He tells us that through too much liberty, here he says it, through too much liberty, they, the Christians, grew negligent and slothful, envying and reproaching one another. Is that Christian? Is that what Jesus said what we must do? Envying and reproaching one another? Waging, as it were, civil wars between themselves? Bishops quarreling with bishops? And the people divided into parties? Black and white? 
poor and rich, bond and free, as today, that hypocrisy and deceit were grown into the highest pitch of wickedness, and that they were become insensible not too much to think of the appeasing of divine, uh, of divine anger, and so on, and so on, and so on. That through too much liberty, that is a very important sentence. Think about that when you are crying for liberty today. As the Roman Catholic Church does, eh? All you can hear her saying is, one, we want liberty, we want freedom, freedom, freedom. What they don't tell you is, they want freedom from the laws of God. That's what their freedom is. The freedom for a Roman Catholic is to be free in that he can practice his idolatrous and superstitious religion, which is contrary to the religion that God imputes on us. The author continues, This was the deplorable state of the Christian Church, which God, as Eusebius well observes, first punished with a gentle hand. But when they, grew, uh, when they grew hardened and incurable in their vices, he was pleased to let in the most grievous persecutions upon them, under Diocletian, which exceeded in severity and length all that had been before. From these accounts, it evidently appears that the Christian world alone is not chargeable with the guilt of the persecution on the score of religion. Well, the Christian world, as I have prepared a little comment here, was and is never chargeable of persecution. The Roman Catholic world is. Christians don't persecute. Roman Catholics do. From these accounts, it, is evidently, uh, it evidently appears that the Christian world alone is not chargeable with the guilt of persecution of the score of religion. No, it's not the religion, it's not the Christian world, it's the Roman Catholic. It was practiced long before Christianity was in being and first taught the Christians by the persecuting heathens. The most eminent philosophers espoused and vindicated persecuting principles and emperors, otherwise excellent and good, made no, uh, made no scruple or destroying multitudes on a religious account, such as Trajan and Aurelius Verus. And I think I may farther add that the method of propagating religion by cruelty and death owes its invention to the lay... Uh, to the lay... Pre Uh, to the lay, to, sorry, to the lay policy and craft, and that how uh, severely soever the priesthood hath taught it fit to imitate them, yet they have never exceeded them in rigor and severity. I can trace out the footsteps, but of very few priests in the foregoing accounts. Nor have I ever heard of more excessive cruelties than those practiced by Antiochus, the Egyptian heretic eaters, and the Roman emperors. I may farther add on this important article that it is the laity who have put it into the power of the priests to persecute, and rendered it worth their while to do it. They have done it by the authority of the civil laws as well as employed lay hands to execute the drudgery of it. Now this last sentence is so important that I really have to read it again, that I hope you will understand it and make, make the relation to what we are living in today. The author says here, I may farther add on this important article that this, the laity Yeah? Not the clergy, the laity, the normal people, the civil servants, you can also say today, who have put it into the power of the priests to persecute. The normal people gave the power to the priests to persecute. 
and rendered it worth their while to do it. So we give this to the priests and prosper from it. They have done it by the authority of the civil laws, as well as employed lay hands to execute the drudgery of it. They have done it by the authority of the civil laws. Now the civil laws, the laws that are made by our temporal government, have to adhere to Roman Catholic canon law because Roman Catholic canon law stands above all other laws. And I think this is a very important sentence because you have to, when you, when you understand this that already happened in the old pagan Roman Empire, you will maybe more understand how many things that happened in Germany during the Third Reich have been made possible. Because the civil servants, the lay people, just laid away their hands and said, I just did what I had to do. I was just following orders. I was just doing what the law told me. And that's how they washed their hands clear of any blood that may be on their hands. The Germans did it in the Third Reich, and I can tell you quite predictably or prophetically <laughs> that in the United States of America you will have the same when the Inquisition is coming to your country now. Because the United States of America is the last bulwark of Protestantism in this world. And the Protestants and the liberal Catholics have to be rooted out. And they will be. By the coming Inquisition into the United States of America. Yeah? You can be sure of that. Now, we have gone very far, but I try to uh, finish this little part here on this video. So I will continue reading here on the last paragraph. The, emol uh, the emoluments of honors and riches that have been annexed to the favorite religion and priesthood is the establishment of the civil society, whereby religion hath been made extremely profitable, and the gains of godliness worth contending for. Had the laity been more sparing in their grants and their civil constitutions formed upon the generous and equitable principles of a universal toleration, persecution had never been heard of amongst men. The priests would have wanted not only the power, but the inclination to persecute. Since few persons have such an attachment either to what they account religion or truth, as to torment and destroy others for the sake of it, unless tempted with the views of worldly ambition, power and grandeur. These views will have the same influence upon all bad minds, whether the priesthood or laity, who, when they are determined at all hazards to pursue them, will use all methods, right or wrong, to accomplish and secure them. As, therefore, the truth of history obliges me to compliment the laity with the honor of this excellent invention, invention, sorry, <laughs> with this, uh, uh, of this excellent invention, for the support of propagation of religion, and as its continuance in the world to this day is owning to the protection and authority of their laws and to certain political ends and purposes, they have severe uh, they have uh, they have to serve thereby the loading the priesthood uh, the loading the priesthood only or principally the infamy and guilt of it is a mean and groundless scandal and to be perpetually objecting the cruelties that have been practiced by some who have called themselves christians on others for conscience sake as an argument against the excellency of the Christian religion, or with a view to prejudice others against it, is an artifice unworthy a person of common understanding and honesty. Let all equally share the guilt, who are equally chargeable with it,
and let principles be judged of by what they are in themselves, and not by the abuses which bad men make, uh, may make of them. If any argument can be drawn from these, we may as well argue against the truth and excellency of philosophy, because Cicero espoused the principles of persecution and Antonymus, the philosopher, authorized the cruelties attending it. But the question in these cases is not what one, uh, what one who calls himself a philosopher or a Christian doth, but what true philosophy and genuine Christianity lead to and teach. And if persecution be the natural effect of either of them, tis neither in my inclination or intention to defend them. But I pass from these reflections to the history of Christian persecutions. And this will end the reading for today. And we will continue next time on page 16 or with section 2 of the persecutions amongst Christians upon account of religion. And I can already assure you now, you do not want to miss that. So, thank you very much for listening and watching to the video. I hope you enjoyed it. I am getting more and more confident with reading this book. It's uh, still hard for me to read here and there some letters and uh, then of course to get the full understanding of it. But you know, we are all doing this and I'm doing this just because the Holy Spirit tells me that the people in the world out there need to know about the Inquisition. They need to bo know about the damnable Inquisition, the history, the real history of the Roman Catholic Church that they call out the Pope as the Antichrist that he is and not clap and give standing ovations as was done in 2015 when the Antichrist visit visited the Congress of the United States of America. You have to identify the Pope as the Antichrist of the Bible that he is and I hope that this book with the history of the Inquisition will help you to do and get that understanding. I am very, very thankful for the Holy Spirit to use me to read this book and I just hope that you will understand that here and there I do not have the perfect pronunciation and here and there I maybe miss a word but that you will get the overall gist of it. So, thank you very much. Until next time, Jogla 66 from Hour of the Truth, signing off. God bless you and bye-bye.